Tea and biscuits, good fellows. Yes, that is what thou shalt find in this wonderful, quirky, charming British dark fantasy. Did I like it? Did I not? Do I eat biscuits and tea? Find out the answer after the break. Hi guys, my name is Matt, also known as Miggins on Twitter, and welcome back to my channel, Hobbit Hole Books. As always, I am extremely excited to bring you this review, and I know I say that a lot, but you guys can probably tell I really am excited about everything that I talk about. But today, I am bringing you another indie review. I am just absolutely beasting through these indies, because, you know, indies, where it's at. First off, I'd like to thank... True These Guys, the author, and RJ Bailey, the audiobook narrator, for putting together this fantastic production in collaboration, obviously, with the writing, with Trudy, and then RJ just completely brings it to life. And, of course, a big, big thank you to the Audiobook Empire Review Guild, who gave me a copy of this audiobook in return for a completely open and honest review. So thank you, guys, for providing me with this opportunity. I, I loved every second of it. First of all, I'm going to start off this review reading out the words that I put on Twitter, probably about 25% into the book. Y'all, <laughs> Americanisms, right? True Disguise is hilarious. Her book, The 13th Hour, has such a whimsical, cheeky humour while still being darkly adult. And I love its quirky little soul. <laughs> really? I could just leave it there, you know, got my cup of tea, get, put my feet up, get, uh, get a couple of bourbons, you know. Job done. That, that's really all that needs to be said, right? But just for you guys, I'm going to go into a little bit more depth because you guys, I just love you. you. Yes, yes, I do. I love you guys. Because I know somewhere deep down in my heart, I still love you! But it really does sum this book up almost really in everything I can say is just condensed into that. It's this quasi-British fable with an immense amount of whimsy and, and wonder, but then you also have these really intensely dark aspects. The book is book one of the Cruel Gods series that True Disguise is writing. Book two comes out in about three weeks. I'm very excited, although I'm still undecided if I'm going to wait until maybe we get an audiobook. But spoiler alert, I don't think I will because I don't think I can. And, and Trudy manages to tie this whimsy, this wonder, this, this British charm up perfectly with some deliciously dark aspects. And frankly, it can get quite disturbing, but really, it's just this... If I had to describe it, it would be like a bourbon biscuit. You get that sweet richness, you get that, 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 that Britishness to it. It's, bourbons are very British, but it's also dark, very delicious, just everything. But before we get into sort of the characters, the plot, more and yada yada, I'm going to read you the blurb of the book so you get an idea of what this book kind of is about. Cruel gods rule the steam-powered city of Chime, demanding worship and tribute from their mortal subjects. Kale lost her faith in them long ago and now seeks to protect vulnerable and downtrodden mortals from their gods' whims. But when Kale discovers powers that she didn't know she had and destroys a mortal soul by accident, she becomes Chime's most wanted. Quen's job was to pursue sinners until the vision started. Haunted by foreboding images of his beloved city's destruction, Quen hunts soul-sucking creatures made of aether who prey on its citizens, and Kale is his number one target. To ensure Chime's future, Kale and Quen must discover the truth of Kale's divine abilities before the gods take matters into their own hands. For a city that bows to cruel gods, it will take godless heathens to save it. Godless heathens, indeed. The Thirteenth Hour is the first book in the Cruel Gods series, a gas lamp fantasy featuring magic portals, gothic cosmic deities, I mean, yes please, quaint Britishisms, 
mm-hmm, 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 mm-hmm. and steampunk vibes. This is an adult book containing a strong language and mature themes that some readers may find disturbing. For a full list of content warnings, visit True Disguise's website, which will be in the links down below. And so, yes, that's basically what this book is about. We are thrust into this really um, atmospheric world that, yes, it's very steampunk, very gas lamp. It's very dark and dingy, and it's run by these gods. You have what's called the, the Twelve Domains, and then you have also the City of Chime. So the Twelve Domains are each run by the gods, and each god has their own domain. And, and there's a lot of diversity and Trudy has clearly thought so, so much about each one. Some of them we spend more time in than others, but each one has its own feel, its own atmosphere, its own grittiness to it. That includes the creatures. Each domain has its own sort of children, the children of the gods. And so you have these quirky little variations between the different domains. I mean, you have some of them like fairy like with wings, you have like these fish like creatures, you have lots and lots of different, different creatures that are all very unique, all very diverse. And that's one thing that this book is this book is very diverse. It has LGBTQ plus themes, it's diverse in, in its racial makeup, in its character makeup, the characters of different skin colors. You have pink, you have blue, you have, oh, you name it. Trudy has well and truly done some really fantastic representation here. So if you're worried about more representation in your books, please do not worry. You can read this book and you will happily find yourself represented in here, even though it's an insane, weird, quirky little fantasy. I think all of us could find something to relate to in this book. Now, as said in, in the kind of blurb section, there are a lot of mature themes in this. It is, it can get really dark, and I mean really dark. Not, I wouldn't put it in the grim dark territory, because I think the difference between grim dark and dark fantasy is that grim dark is more about morally grey, whereas a dark fantasy can be as intense or even more intense than some grim dark books. But the characters are not necessarily morally grey, and, and that's really the case here. I mean, there are some scenes that really, I was riding home at night on my bike from work, listening to the audio, and I really kind of had to stop and go, Phew. like, I need a minute after this, you know? And, and so I really would recommend that you go onto Trudy's website, check out the content warnings. I'll put the link down below because there is some really stuff here that, that could trigger people potentially. I don't know quite how Trudy manages to hold it together, but the soul of this book, and this book really does have a soul. It really felt alive, especially thanks to RJ's narration, but most importantly, due to Trudy's brilliant prose and writing. But the soul of this book, I think, is like a little like the soul of us all. You have a dash of childlike awe, a splash of trauma. Who doesn't? You know, it's very sad. And one huge lumpful of saccharine coated heart. And yes, despite the darkness, this book has heart and humour and it has it in spades. Now, the Hardy's novel comes straight from the relationship between the two main characters, Kale and Quen. So Kale, she's kind of the character we're first introduced to. She is a member of the Godless. Now, the Godless is a rebel society established in the city of Chime in opposition to the gods and their callous desires of the mortals. Now, I need to go back and talk about the domains again. So the 12 domains, they're all unique. And then you have Chime, which essentially is meant to be a place just for mortals. Gods don't rule it. It's the mortal's domain, so to speak. And there's sort of a covenant, a contract between the gods and the mortals that sets out the laws and regulations about the gods and, and what they're allowed to do. Now, essentially, the gods have impunity. They, they have what they call diviners, who are the kind of the, the lawmen, the, the policemen, so to speak, of the domains. They have the ability to sort of control time and manipulate time. Although Trudy is very good at, at sort of keeping it within the bounds of her own rules that she sets in place. So it's not like the MCU where they, things can contradict one another and, and the canon kind of gets lost. Trudy is very, very good that even though this isn't a particularly hard fantasy magic system, Trudy does kind of stick to the rules and, and sets them in place. And so essentially the diviners rule and keep the law in chime, but also all 12 domains. Now, the reality is, as can be expected, that they're pretty much 
corrupt you know they they have their own self-interest and so the gods are kind of allowed to rule with impunity and that's where you get the cruel gods from because they just completely use and abuse their mortals and it's really i mean they are really really cruel now in a welcome change the godless's focus is it's less on deconstructing the society and taking it down in a reckless fashion in an anarchistic fashion that kind of burn the system to the ground sense but rather more about looking after those who have been affected who've been used and abused and manipulated by the gods so of course they want to take down society, that's their ultimate goal, but their immediate goal is not to cause chaos and sow destruction because they recognise that there are systems in place that, that are necessary, they just need to look after the people and get the people on their side and hope that eventually their time comes that the gods will meet their downfall. Now on the opposite side of this, we have Quentin Cohen, also known simply as Quen. Quen is one of the Divine Wardens, so he's one of those who are in charge of keeping order across the City of Chime and the Twelve Domains. As said earlier, they, they claim to be arbiters of this constitution, but in reality it's kind of torn to shreds and the gods are just allowed to do whatever they want. These Diviners are fiercely loyal to their gods and deeply corrupt, and it just leaves the other mortals to face unimaginable acts of torture and abuse if they anger their gods. And it's not even sort of anger their gods in a troublesome sense, if, if they don't have enough money to give to their gods, to, to pay fealty to their gods, then they can be tortured in the most horrific ways. You know, something as simple as that. These gods are not good beings. So we start off our journey by watching the hands of fate twist and turn to bring Ken and Quail together into each other's delightfully quaint company. So Kale is on a mission for the godless, and if she fails, her partner Markovan will be surely taken by the gods and brutally tortured, as well as all the refugees they're trying to harbour in their safe haven. They will all be sort of taken away and tortured and, you know, you, you, it doesn't even bear thinking about. As usual, Kale is late. You know, we find that we start off the book with her running after the tram. So we start off the book with Kale running after the tram. She's always, always late. She's got this sort of anxious, nervous energy to her, this sort of clumsiness, but not, not clumsiness, this sort of awkwardness, this, this awkward charm to her. So as usual, Kale is late, and Quentin Coyne does so hate being late. He is, after all, Divine and Warden, one of the keepers of time. Precision and order are his constant companions, but this twist of fate will end up in Kale being one of Charm's most wanted and directly into the lap of Quentin Corrin. Now, Kale has an amusingly sarcastic and frenetic inner voice that she labels Jinx, which does try to warn her of certain dangers, but, you know, most of the time, Kale just does her own thing, and she ends up with one of the most fervent warders of all. I mean, Quen, he is an absolute stickler for rules and order and precision and faith and religion. Quen has an unhealthy scepticism of the godless and dislike for godless heathens. So, you know, it's, doesn't, it's not exactly a match made in heaven, right? But he's always had a soft spot for the godless in his blessed little heart. And together they must unravel a corrupt conspiracy which has the power to take down Chime and leave the Twelve Domains in chaos. And as we know, Quentin Coyne really does hate chaos. Now, as mentioned before, it is truly the partnership between these two characters, their charming and witty banter, and their growing understanding of one another that is the key to the centre of this whimsical yarn. The book is told from both perspectives, so if you're listening on the audio, it, it can be a little confusing. I did read some reviews before, so I was prepared that, that when the chapter sort of changed, and it's still obviously RJ the narrator, there, there are distinctions between the two characters and the voices, but it, it doesn't sort of notify you in the first sense. If you're reading the book in the physical or Kindle format, you will be fine. But each perspective has their own distinct and bold voice, and yet the cohesiveness of the story is second to none, you know? It seamlessly kind of rolls into one another. And it's such a delicate balancing act. I mean, I wouldn't even be surprised if Trudy told me she learned how to tightrope walk just to write this book because it really is a, a balancing act. Uh, both anxious characters have an anxious wit to them, which is the only way really to describe their very British sensibilities. It's very much like a, 
Oh golly, gosh, yes. Uh, oh, well, yeah, yeah, it's, you know that kind of thing that 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 kind of Boris Johnsonisms <laughs> and and style of humour. From the staccato of the prose and frenetic moments of anxiety to the moments of awkward cringe humour that stems from the anxious personalities, Trudia's characterisation down to a T. But this balancing act comes from the contrast between this light humour on the one hand, sprinkled with a dusted fondant of adult humour as well. You know, it's like the salt bay. You know, and from what I've heard, Trudy says that book two is uh, even more blush worthy. So <laughs> hold on tight, guys. And then there's some of the very dark subject matter involved in this book. So you're holding these two things in tension, the, the very dark subject matter and this very sort of witty humour. And it's by no means a grimmed up book. And I'm really not a squeamish reader. I mean, I almost want to go and discover what would make me not read a book because I really, you know, I'm not phased by most things in a book. But even in here, there were some utterly uncomfortable moments of despicable cruelty and abuse, which had me squirming on my little leather bike seat as I was riding home from work. You know, we, we see the best, but also the worst of humanity reflected. But having these two characters of Kale and Quentin that anchor us in this narrative and the turmoil, they, they always give me light and, and hope for a better world, for a world where the mortals didn't face such cruelty, where the godless and the ones that love the gods can get along and, and support one another and build a better society. And, and these two characters, they give me hope for that, despite the darkness there is still light. It, it reminded me of the beauty that humanity can bring into the darkness. You know, we, we live in a world that's very difficult, very chaotic. You know, just look at the news. But still, there's little touching moments of humanity. And yes, I'm a cynic. And yes, I'm really kind of sceptical of things. But also, there is a beauty. And, and that's reflected in this book. And it really made me appreciate the little acts of kindness every day. You know, Kale never gave up and neither shall I. I. I'd like to think that I'll always have that little ray of hope and this book really kind of emulated that for me. And, and that's just how much this book made me feel. And, and again, credit to R.J. Bailey's narrative performance in tandem with Trudy's wordsmith prowess that it hits so hard. And we'll talk about this later. There are moments that didn't hit quite as hard or didn't hit how they should. And that's okay because not every moment is going to hit that hard. But in general, this book really spoke to me. Trudy packs these punches, guys, and Argy just rolls with them with a big dose of gusto and welly. Doing my best Brian Blessed impression there. <laughs> Those two, RJ and Trudy, they are the real Kale and Quinn. They are the, the true partnership. You know, it's utterly delightful. Not since Kate Redding, Michael Kramer and Robert Jordan have we had such a dynamic partnership between authors and their narrators. I'm not ashamed to say I, I shed a tear or two at certain moments thanks to RJ's hauntingly emotional performance and of course Trudy's brilliant writing. Even just like writing and filming these reviews, like some of these moments, they're seared in my mind. I can remember like, I'm in my flat right now and just the other side out of the kitchen is the garage and I remember walking in and, and there's this really intense moment right at the end and I just shed a tear and I remember standing there for a moment like, like you know, it really got to me. For about three weeks that I listened to this, these two were the soundtrack to my life, accompanying me to and from and whilst at work and amidst some of the darkness of the narrative the strength of the humour pulled me through and its British eccentricities actually made me proud to be British again, which, you know, of course, you know, I, I, I'm i British and, and, and I like my country despite its problems. I've not always been able to say that I'm proud of my country, but I think I'm proud of our British personalities in general. And, and this book made me want to own our little quirks that sometimes feel a little bit weird, but you know, we're British, damn it. <laughs> And we're gonna own it. And and truly, you know, she manages to capture all sides of the equation. You know, this might not be a grim dark book, but it doesn't mean that there aren't sort of moral quandaries within this, that there aren't sort of questions. Quen is not simply a ramp rampantly religious bigot. That would have been the easy road to go down. 
and Kale's not an anarchist rebel that's down with the system throwing, like, arson bombs, like, at everything, you know? Quent is simply a man who loves order and timeliness. He loves his tea done just right. He loves his home comforts, but he loves order above all else. He's a good and a caring heart. He cares for the people. He cares about the law. He cares about justice and what is right for society. And he sincerely believes in his role as a warden to protect mortals and uphold the constitution. Kale, she's just trying to survive. She wants nothing more than her and her people to be free of the gods' woeful whims. All she wants is to be left alone in peace. I, I mean, that's something we can all relate to, you know? I mean, this, this review is getting to like 20 minutes or something. I haven't even spoken about the world building or the magic, but you know, it's, oh, it's so good. Now, so we talked a little bit about the domains earlier, but I'll go into them in a little bit more detail here. Each of the domains is connected to a different god. We have Valeria, who is probably the cruelest of the gods, and pff, truly, she is a nasty, nasty piece of work. There isn't sufficient time in this book, even though it's quite a chunk, it's about 500, it's over 500 pages, I believe. Uh, and this, but despite that, there isn't sufficient time to explore all the gods. They all made their presence known in this book, and, and suddenly in the sequels, there's suddenly room and scope to explore the gods a lot more. And of course, their presence is always looming over the plot. So they're kind of in the background a lot. Now, the settings of Chime and the Domains, they're meticulously constructed, each with a unique flourish. Trudy's really thought about every impact different aspects of the world would have on it, the, the, the way that different creatures are created and the different things that they can do, the, the way that each domain has different sort of weather systems and things like that and, and how that would impact things. It's not something I often encounter well in world building. I mean, not to this extent. There are some fantastic world builders out there and I think Trudy is in that top line of world builders. Some of them, they're a thousand page chunkers, chock full of world building, but Trudy really impressed me because Yes, this is a chonker, but still, there wasn't that much sort of exposition here. There's this sense of scale and scope to the world, but we are still relatively kind of self-contained in, in several different locations, but you still get a sense of the wider world. And I was very impressed by that. And, and, and of course, you do get that author's think about the impact of different world building aspects have on, on the world itself. But truly, really kind of made it stand out here. And, and it's really baked into the narrative. In a world of order and perfection and timeliness, it makes sense to have these worlds so meticulously constructed and everything has to be in its perfect position or chaos will ensue. And there's a fair amount of chaos, let me tell you that. I mean, a lot of the world building is done up front, constructing the streets of chime in our minds. And like I said, it is a very steampunk gas lamp-esque vibe. However, the British charm kind of sells you right in. It is done a lot up front and you're kind of thrown into the action almost straight away really. So yes, there's, there's well building heavy at the front, but also truly guides you into it. The details of this part of the ride, it's something to absorb, but it's not necessary to remember every single detail. You're not gonna be flicking through the book to find out what this type of brick is meant to do to this person's magic you know it's it's there if you want to if you want to go deeper and Trudy's written a, a world building kind of guide as well that I need to read as far as where I've heard good things about it the, the handbook to chime and I will read that at some point so if you want to go deeper the opportunity is there but you don't need to and the magic's there in the book as well but not potentially in the sense that you would imagine it's not your typical romanticism era fantasy, very medieval-esque, where, where something fantastical would be out of the ordinary. This isn't utterly and striking and original creation. Each domain has its own form of mortal, and the 12 sets of mortals all have their own set of powers. So you have, for example, a necro is one of the kind of mortals, and necro has healing powers. They're kind of the doctors in the society. A vesper has powers to create shadows. A diviner has power over time, etc., etc. And then there's also the mysterious unit known as Aether, which is kind of like the blood of Chime, the best way to describe it, and it's being pumped around to fuel the electricity needs of the citizens. It's a rather soft magic system, and yet each type of mortal is extremely diverse from the others, and for me it was a perfect blend because you had some of these hard and fast rules, 
but the magic was never something that you had to worry about remembering every detail and you know sometimes I get lost in these magic systems I love them but sometimes I, I don't understand them fully and but here you know I didn't have to worry about that you know as much as the central partnership of Ken and Quail is kind of the heart and the center of this book and dominates the narrative you also have some wonderful quirky side characters ranging from the disgustingly evil to the delightfully ditzy my favourite was probably the raunchy and indeed very randy Malkavan partner to Kale. He provided many funny moments of humour when he entered the narrative, but he also brings the emotional depth when needed. So, you know, he's a very um, malleable character. And then to speak of the depth of the novel, we're going to speak about some of the themes. There's some pretty heavy themes in it, but it never felt like Trudy was grandstanding or politicking or whatever you want to call it. It never felt like that. I mean, some of the topics we cover, just to give you an idea, we look at religion, free will, how far would and should you go to save others? There's so much more in there that I could talk about. But this book would definitely give you a lot to think about and wonder what, what would you do? Indeed, what is the right thing to do in some of these situations? Fair warning, there is also a fair dash of romance within these pages. But I thought it was very tastefully done and I'm really not a romance fan normally, so you know, props to Trudy. But then having said all these wonderful things about why this book is such a fantastic read, what stops it from reaching the heady heights of a five star? Well, let's talk a little about pacing. Now the first half, the first half absolutely blew me away. It's incredibly well paced, it's relentless but not chaotic, plot rich but not character development redundant. The second half, it didn't hit quite as well for me. And that was simply because it had too many intense moments and too many climaxes for my taste. Ah, <laughs> oh, you gotta excuse me, I'm terrible. Yes, you, you heard that right. Too much of a good thing can sometimes detract and unfortunately this is what happened in the case of 13th Hour. I was fully devoted and invested in this novel up to and beyond the 50% mark. Things were still pacing along and there were emotional moments starting to hit. Emotional moment after emotional moment after action moments. And after a while, this, this started to jar on me a little. You know, I, I would get myself ready. I'd be going, here we go, here we go. Here's the climax. Here's like the, the end, the, the Trudy Lanch, so to speak. And then I'd look at the, the audiobook and there'd be like 40% left. And I thought, huh. And after a while, it... it it just started to get to me because I started to lose that anticipation of the finale. I kind of like, right, I want to, you know, it's like when you're climbing a hill and you get the false summit and you're getting excited and then you have like five or six false summits. And then after a while, you're kind of like, I've not got that giddy excitement that I had four summits ago. I, I just want to get to the top and see the view now. There were so, so many moments the book could have chosen to end with and for those of you who love your fast-paced action moments to not let up, alongside devastatingly emotional sequences, this will be for you. I know Andrew over at Andrew's Resilient Reads did love it, so it is for some people more than I. However, it just led me to feel things were a little bit redundant, because when everything feels like the climax, then the climax loses some of its power. You know what I mean? And then furthermore, the twists at the end, some of them didn't quite work for me. Whilst I didn't guess them beforehand, they did surprise me to an extent, I was left with a sort of feeling of, huh, wow, okay. For whatever reason that I can't quite place it, it didn't quite hit for me. So it wasn't that I guessed it or it didn't feel necessarily earned. It just kind of felt like this doesn't really change how I feel about the world and the characters. And in the end, it descended into this maelstrom of chaos, which was at times difficult to follow with the audio. I think if I had read the ending in the physical copy or a Kindle, I may have felt differently. But with the audio, it did become a bit frenetic and chaotic. But ultimately, it didn't spoil my experience with this book because everything else hits so, so hard. And even whilst feeling some of those concerns towards the end, the emotions did still get to me because of RJ's beautiful, beautiful performance, because of that sincerity that was in there. And RJ as well, he, he does a really good range of voices. Man, I love you RJ, man. You've become friends, which is lovely. It was by no means a bad second half. It was, it like, Compared to some books, that, that was an amazing second half. I, I simply got a little burnt out from the excitement of multiple events that felt climatic and then it just turned out to be another phonetic escapade.
Nevertheless, listen, it's as close to a five star as you can get, really. It's a pitch perfect mix of quirky Britishisms and deeply intimate emotional resonance. It also leaves you on a bit of a cliffhanger, so I eagerly await book two in, oh, about three weeks. Lucky me! In conclusion, wrapping it back round, y'all, true disguise, hilarious. Her book, The 13th Hour, has such a whimsical, cheeky humour while still being darkly adult, and I love its quirky little British soul. Enough said. Now, I'm off for my tea and biscuits. Thank you, guys. Uh, I hope you enjoyed that. Please, all the links down below to Trudy's Twitter, website. Check out all of Trudy's works. Check out her content warnings, please. I Really, you should, because there will be some triggering things. All my usual things down below, all the links to the Discord, my Amazon wish list, if you wish to be very generous. Please like, subscribe, comment if you read this book, or if is this book on your TBR. Comment whatever you like. I just love to interact with you guys. Thank you so, so much for watching. I hope you have a great week, and I'll be back sometime next week with some more fun reviews and chaos, because that's what we love on this channel. Chaos! Till next time.